Yeah. Okay, graphene is not superconductor yet. Uh, so there is no superconducting application. Yeah, yeah. I'm just talking in terms of number one is graphene, number two is uh, superconducting. Okay, good. And, so uh, let me, let me start with the uh, graphene applications. I think well, there are at least many of them. I think uh, there are some discussions of what is the first applications one can see. And many people believe that actually uh, the flexible screen might be the first one, uh, especially replacing the um, indium tin oxide. Part of the reason is graphene is conducting, but also it's very thin, so light can go through very well, and it's flexible. So combining all of these three, three components, the one immediate application you can imagine is of the, uh, the conducting electro electrode of the, uh, the flexible screens, where you can oh, touch the screen, I would say. Right? So um, certainly that's kind of one, one part that actually people got excited about. The other one is basically graphene, although this is one atom thick materials, uh, if this is perfect, nothing can penetrate through, even the proton cannot penetrate through. So this is actually good barrier materials people try to use. Uh, often that organic um, lighting and emitting diode, uh, you need kind of some capping layer. Uh, good conductors, but also light can go through, but it's good chemical uh, barrier. People also consider using the graphene for the, those kind of uh, the, uh, purpose. Now, what would be the far-reaching goal is can I, can I use the graphene for the electrical channel that replacing silicon? Um, although mobility is extremely high in the graphene, there is no band gap, such that it's very difficult to realize good electrical switches out of the graphene at this point. So that's already a far-reaching goal, but certainly it's still kind of something uh, uh, thinkable. Um, there are two D materials I mentioned, and there are superconductors, right? And some of these superconductors, and people believe that uh, can turn into the so-called topological superconductor. And that becomes quite interesting because the uh, physics theory tells us if you just create the so-called topological superconductor, you can create the so-called quantum bit, qubits, which is topologically protected. So many people think that maybe if you just realize the topological superconductor, that can be a good platform that one can realize uh, the quantum computers where that qubit can be topologically protected. So that has not been completely demonstrated, but many people are working on that direction. So I hope that in probably within a few years, there are some demonstration experimentally can, realized, can be realized. Thank you. Um, uh, about electron flow in the topmost layer, which yeah. is modulated by all the stuff which is underneath it, or is it more complicated than yeah. that? Yeah, well, you should come to my talk tomorrow. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but as uh, short answer is indeed, yes, right. So it actually depends on the composition of the materials. Um, if you use the really highly conducting materials in one side and both sides, then of course uh, this, uh, the cross talk or tunneling between them is basically perturbations, right? Um, or, but if you just kind of bias between the two layers, then most of the voltage is happening across the two layers. So that is almost uh, the uh, active side of your device. However, now if you have these uh, poor materials, semiconducting materials with poor, but also both of side, but you make the coupling rather strong, then, then, uh, then you have to think about current path is rather complicated because it's not only just kind of flow through the one layer and turn around on the other one, but their successive tunneling across the channel will make the things more complicated. So it all depends on the detail of the device structures. Um, often the other exciting part is you don't have to even just kind of make the, the tunneling between them and just uh, one layer is conducting, but just put the another layer they, they close by. But they don't have to, uh, even if there is no tunneling, there's pull of intention can happen. So charge flow one layer can affect charge flow the another layer. This is what you call the Coulomb graph and that could happen in the system. So it depends on the device geometry, you can realize various different type of the devices. I'm going to discuss that some, some part in tomorrow, so uh, we can discuss a bit more tomorrow after so I give you a bit more examples. Yeah, uh, you mentioned about that you take single monolayers, uh, like monolayers, and you can stack them, and yeah. you can form new materials. Yeah. So how important is the lattice matching? So uh, um, the part of the question is that if there is no lattice matching, will you uh, expect any strain? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question, um, <clears throat> and a very important question. Now, of course, uh, in traditionally in semiconductor heterostructures, then everything you have to consider is a lattice matching, because if you don't match the lattice, what happens is there is a dislocation appears and creates some of the defects. And part of the reason that the problem of traditional semiconductor heterostructure is basically there's chemical, real chemical bond 
between this layer, right? So if you just don't match this chemical bond well, that will immediately create the defects. Now, beauty of the Vandeva system is all the chemical bond is within the layer, and between the layer, there is no real chemical bond, which means that in principle, if you just kind of put the arbitrary angle, right, there is no broken chemical bond to create the real defects. And that's why this, all this um, that thing that I mentioned, that if you just kind of stack in the different angle, uh, they can still just uh, do some things, right? However, although there is no real chemical bond, and the Van der Waals force is weak, there's still some Van der Waals interactions, and there is some reconstruction can happen due to the, this weak Van der Waals interaction. However, but that's basically kind of weak perturbation. Yes, they indeed affect the material properties, but not as strongly as the three-dimensional heterostructures, right? So, lattice matching is do matter to create what kind of this uh, commensuration in commensuration structure have, right? That uh, one can just realize in this size system. In that regard, lattice matching is a static angle and those kinds of things are important. And also, how the electron interaction is happening, how tunneling is happening, that's related with the momentum, uh, the conservation across the brilliant zone. So those kind of things, yes, do matter, but not as catastrophically as the uh, three-dimensional heterostructures. <laughs> so that's already sort of problems. And one can also use that as a new degree of freedom to create this uh, three, three, uh, the quasi-three-dimensional structures based on this uh, the Van der Waals system. So, why do these effects seem to happen more commonly or easily in two-dimensional materials or reduced dimensional materials? And what is it about uh, three-dimensional materials that seems to have not have this as common? Right, okay, so, um, the, okay, general answer that is that most of the, the usually quantum mechanical effect is actually enhanced in the lower dimension. Part of the reason is your phase space becomes more confined. Uh, so the usually it's very susceptible to the quantum mechanical effect. That's just the most general part. Technologically, the 2D materials or low dimensional material that we have uh, more controllabilities, but 2D materials basically we have a surface we can control. Bulk materials that changes we can make it easy, the temperature, applying the magnetic field, and that's about it, right? But 2D materials that we can just do something on the surface, and more important part is we have the gate. This kind of conductor nearby, charging that conductors, basically we can induce the carriers there, and that's kind of make the big difference in 2D materials, 1D as well as 0D. So low dimensional system, therefore, that well, cross what quantum mechanical effect becomes stronger. Second, we have more controllability, and that's why actually making this more specific. Now, heterostructure is something in between, right? In, in the end, we just created some of the three dimensional structures, right? But you see that uh, it is as much as kind of quasi two dimensional in a sense. We have the more control of the all this atomic layer, so it is kind of a uh, kind of interesting combination that we use the advantage of the two D system and bring it to the three dimensional structures in that regard. Um, um, so you discussed that uh, uh, you can produce uh, pseudo electrons uh, in the graphene sheet and yeah, pseudo spins. Yeah. So, so, uh, yeah. Pseudo spins in uh, the graphene sheet. Uh, could you also uh, make spin the opposite and make a pseudo anti electron? Or oh, yes, yes. And yeah, right. That's will they right. result in the same kind of pair production you do when you do uh, the regular uh, particle interactions? Also, um, will you be able to simulate a, a, a pseudo proton and make a pseudo atom? <laughs> and so on and so forth? Good, yeah, that's a good point. Right. I'm not sure about the pseudo proton, but uh, so the analogies about this particle antiparticle in the their equations, and like the electrons, positron. Is it exactly happens in the same analogy in the graphene, right? So simply the condensed matter physics is called the electron and hole. And hole that you create, basically missing electron you create it in the, uh, the field Fermi C of there is precisely very similar analogy of the, the uh, positron of the antiparticle of the electron cases. So that analogy is that appears in high energy physics on the, uh, the relativist quantum mechanics actually precisely works into the graphene band. 
creating electrons and holes as particles and antiparticles, where that, uh, this, the chirality, in other words, the direction of the spin to the momentum is opposite, actually, exactly works. So, analogy is rather complete in that regard, except that instead of speed of light onto the real, real equations, here it is Fermi velocity, which is determined by the band structures, which so is about 300 times smaller than real speed of the light. Uh, that's only the difference, but analogy actually works quite well into the graphing case. What is your opinion about that in the uh, supercomputing environment using that? Oh, using the graphic. Graphic per se uh, is a very close to topological insulator, but it's not topological insulator. There is no real topological protections there. So uh, the using the graphene as a supercomputing uh, in terms of topological protection doesn't work too well. Now, there are other probably mechanisms one can imagine to use this as a uh, topological computing, such as inducing the superconductivities and so on. There are some of the efforts is going on, especially under the magnetic field. And if you proximitize it with a superconductor, you may actually create something very similar flavor like the chiral superconductivities in there. And that's maybe one way that one can realize. But all of these things is uh, really far away still, and it's under the very uh, beginning stage of the research. So if you ask me that whether, well, do you have any uh, real projection that graphing can be used in the quantum computing? Um, if you're coming from the my funding agency, I would say yes. <laughs> but if you ask me all this opinion, do you want to really invest your stuff? Well, I'm not sure. <laughs> but these days, it has become pretty common, you know, the R&D on uh, graphing. Yes, that's yeah, right. It's pretty, becoming pretty common yeah, these days. Right. So I think uh, it's a very common because uh, this has a lot of interest in uh, the material properties. Uh, that uh, one, one wants to study about that. And certainly it's true that some of this material property is actually deeply related with uh, uh, potential applications. Uh, but to tell the truth, which one actually really get into the potential application is a very difficult thing to predict and to say. So as much as I can say that as a scientist, I'm interested in a lot of intriguing properties of graphene and, and the 2D materials. And I can say that they may actually relate with some of the applications eventually. Uh, but is that the relation is really solid. At this point, we are really at the beginning stage. It's very difficult to kind of say some things with confidence. Thank you. Uh, one question. So you have talked about stacking layers. So you yeah. have talked about stacking layers yeah. and uh, making my pattern. How much control the current experimental, let's say, cutting edge experiments have on, let's say, either the stacking angles or uh, how precisely can you place these layers? Yeah, so I think, uh, okay. So uh, do we have, in terms of stack and control, do we have almost 0 0.0 degree. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, 0.1 degree of the control. So basically, if you have the same single crystals, and basically this is mechanical rotation, right? So how good is your mechanical stage rotation? I think reasonable case, so you one can get down to the Point one degree type of the resolution. Um, the alignment accuracy is about probably half micron easily. Uh, if you just try out uh, maybe even a few hundred nanometer scale. But certainly you cannot align in atomic length scale, angstrom scale, because we don't have, this is all kind of mechanical stage we have to control. So uh, we don't have the, that length, uh, the level of the atomic length scale of this, the lateral control, but at least kind of half micron length scale. Uh, a lot of the times, though, once you make the, this interface really clean, and once you control this stacking angle reasonably well, but detail of this reconstruction in atomic scale is happening through this uh, basically thermodynamic interactions. So um, that is what nature control on the, that atomic length scale. Hello. Uh, sir, I'm doing my business in chemistry. So could you please uh, give a few applications of carbon nanotube in the catalytic point of view or pharma pharmacology? Yeah, okay. So, um, nanotube is something that I worked on the, uh, during my PhD. And uh, uh, the, that was really hard materials back then. And then uh, it's probably nowadays 2D materials, right? But then if I, I, I'm actually still working on the nanotube, and then somebody actually finds me, oh, you're still working on the nanotube. <laughs> so often the questions you have. But it's interesting that um, the nanotube 
uh, there are still a very exciting scientific problems one can study because it's the idea of 1D system and how this 1D conductor works like, that's basically the ideal system that you want to work with. Um, so physically, there are still many interesting problems there. And you may say, that, well, this material is around, so there may not be a lot of the application, and maybe this material is there. But that's actually precisely the opposite way. If you go to the nanotube conference, still there are thousands of people together. And what they actually study is about how to use this as a kind of real applications. In fact, nanotube can be now produced in terms of cons, 10 cons, 100 cons at that level. And a lot of applications is being sought, such as kind of adding this nanotube in the battery, increase the battery efficiency, using this nanotube as an additive of the certain the, uh, the uh, polymer regimes that can make the composite materials, make the mechanical properties better, thermal properties and conducting properties better. So certainly there are a lot of the applications based on the nanotubes now, they do exist. I'm simply not, I'm not the expert, expert working on this material process for the nanotube for the real application, but you can certainly find out the, uh, a lot of application based on nanotube. In fact, simply saying that nanotubes are produced in terms of now tons and 10 tons, 100 tons, tells us that there must be applications based on this material. Yeah. Storage applications. Storage applications. I think, uh, let's go by one by one. So, yeah. uh, in Dirac formula, you mentioned that uh, V equal to C. The electron velocity is equal to C, na. So, how it relates your uh, size? Right. So it turns out, I, I, I probably didn't emphasize too much, but the Dirac equation, there's one important difference between the real Dirac equations and graphene. Let me just see whether I can go to that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So this is a real Dirac equations, and of course, uh, the kinetic energy is kind of, uh, the large that mass is kind of ignored there. Okay, so this is a kind of simpler form, so there is no C's in there, but let me just go to the, uh, then this equations. Semi-Dirac equations, I just wrote down. Okay, and, all right, so let me just, okay, so this is close by. Anyway, anyways, it's the, it's the, the, uh, the energy spectrum of the Dirac equation. If you look at the real Dirac equations, Right. The difference here is that this is not the VR, but this is a C, real speed of the light. Right. In here, basically, it's an analogical uh, Dirac equation in a sense that it's not that really the slope is uh, really steep like the speed of the light. The slope is determined by this, um, the band structure of the graphene, which is about 300 times smaller than real speed of the light. So in that regard, it's not real Dirac equation, but it's analogical Dirac equation. But nevertheless, mathematical structures there, such as that the electron is chiral, in other words, the spin is either parallel or parallel with the momentum, is it analytically works. Here, the spin is replaced by the pseudo spin, right? So, okay, I think we'll uh, stop here. There are a lot of questions. Let's thank uh, Professor Philip Kim again for a very nice. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for your time. Uh, there's a copy outside. I invite you all to have some. Uh,